are all set up here and ready to nano felt our neck warmer. Let me just go over the tools that we have today. The first thing to note is that my table is covered in plastic. I have seams that run through my table because this is a insert section here. So that keeps the water from running through and also allows us to contain the water by folding it over in case it starts to run. I have a spa or pool cover that you can get at any pool supply store. It's the blue bubbles. It's very rigid and nice to work on. I like to have it not too much bigger than my project. In this case, this one is longer, but not too much wider because that's a lot of bulk to handle if you're making something small. This resist is just a guide for our layout and I'll show you how we got there, but this is approximately where our fiber and silk is going to be laid out. We have a pull noodle and this is something else I have various sizes available to me. So just cut them just a little bit larger than your project. We are going to wet out using our ball bras, which is a water sprinkler tool and a sponge is another, just a standard kitchen sponge is another thing I like to use. Our olive oil soap, which is just divine. I use it just in the block. I don't shave it or anything. Um, and you can just dry it out in between uses. We'll use our Heartfelt Silks Palm Washboard. This is great for the initial rubbing. You can even use it in the fulling as well, but it's wonderful for getting your project, the fibers to start to migrate through the silk. I like to use two layers of mesh to sandwich my project, and that's just the way I learned and the way I like to work. Some people just use one. My water preference for nano felting is just straight out of the tap. So just room temperature or cold water. And then of course, a couple of towels. So these are all the basic tools we need. Now how I got to the size of this resist is I've taken to creating um, just a mock, a mock template for when I'm wanting to repeat something. And so I've started using just inexpensive polar fleece. This is approximately the size that I want my neck warmer. If you felt it with me before, you know I'm pretty organic and I don't have a lot of hard lines either in my work or in my style. So I'm willing to go a little beyond that. But this is an example of another um, neck warmer that we created using the same template, but I definitely pushed the boundaries both top and bottom. And that complete project is available on our tutorial for doing large shawls and wraps, as well as neck warmers. Um, and that's available on our site. But this is the idea that we're gonna follow today, although in a completely different color theme, just to mix it up for you. And this was the minimum size that I wanted the main body to be. So before any scoops or swirls started to happen, I wanted it to be at least this long. And this template is that guide. That shrinkage is gonna vary depending on the fiber you use and the, fi the fabrics that you use in your project. And so be willing to make a few and just see how it goes. I've also marked here for myself two arrows that show essentially the parts that will shrink down to wrap just around the neck and meet in the middle. So that ends up being more about, once it's shrunk, about right there, it's about it falls about right there. So if that matters to you, what's right on the back of the neck or right on the back of a shawl, it's nice to kind of figure out what's that approximate shrinkage if you don't want something right underneath your hair. So this is sort of the size we're going for, but I like to be very organic. And this is resist is just gonna be our guide. So let's look at the fibers and fabrics we're going to use. Let's take a quick look at the supplies we're gonna to use today. This is my color and texture palette, and I really like to mix that up. But I always start with a basic color theme, and today we're going with the starter for inspiration is our Fairy Hollow Designer Pack, which is generally over here. That might vary a little bit each time we make a round of the packs, but the specialty designer packs are various color themes that combine fine merino tops with some New Zealand Coriadale, usually our well-loved MC1 batting, merino silk blends, sometimes multicolored merino blends, 
dyed locks. These are mohair, which we like to use most often. They have a nice sheen and some fun novelty yarns that are complimentary. Now, these are just a surface design pack and we're not gonna be using the batting or the New Zealand Coriol Coriadale today because we're making something next to the skin. But to build on that palette, I brought in some more merino tops. These are 19 micron merino tops. So you always want to make sure that you have enough on hand for whatever's the size of your project. We have some dyed Tessa silks, which are just beautiful in sheen and also add a nice bit of texture. We have lots of colors of these available. I have a general textural palette over here. So I have some dyed locks. These are tease water that I dyed with acid dyes. We sell jacquard acid dyes in the shop and those are fun to work with. I have some, these are sari silk ribbons, which I've also dyed. It's just some various textures. These are silk hankies. Silk hankies are silk cocoons that have been stretched into a square. This particular one is commercially dyed, so it's a solid color, produces a really nice sheen. These have been hand dyed, acid dyed, so they're variegated. Super fun to work with. I have um, just some of the silk I've crudely spun just so we can get some texture. And the same thing with the merino top, just to give us some loops and swirls in our project. The fabrics we're going to be working with are, this is dyed silk chiffon, this is dyed habitai silk. Even though these are commercially dyed, I do warn you that sometimes I still see runoff from them, so be caution with that. If you use anything that's white in your project along with these dyed silks, you might want to expel any of the dye first by rinsing them before and drying them before you bring them in. You can add wet silks to your projects as well, but usually you do that when you're trying to control uh, a certain texture. This is my risk taker for this project. This is a thrift store find. I don't know whether it's polyester or silk, so I'm gonna work in just a little bit of that. But usually when I bring in something that um, I don't know if it will felt, that's not silk, um, I test it first. So this is a piece from a commercial scarf that I bought. I don't know, probably a world market or something. I don't know what the content is, but I did test it. So I nano felted it to some of our merino top just to make sure that the fibers would migrate. So no risk there. So we will not use all of this, even if we were making a big shawl, we wouldn't use all of this volume. And I may decide not to use everything I've brought in. I just like to start with textures and colors in a particular theme. And I personally like to really mix it up. We are gonna start our layout and uh, just wanted to show you that our template is about 33 and, I planned it for 33 and a half, but I didn't cut it straight. So it's 33 and a half to 33 and three quarters, just as our basic guide for how we're going to lay out. And our finished piece, I want it to be between 24 and 25 inches long and then five to six, five, five and a half inches wide. So this is say 33 and a half by six inches. This is six and a half inches. Um, and the area that I marked in between the neck is 22, shrinking down to about 26. That's how this, that's how the, the plan was. And you might start with just a general guide to see how you do. So the template I'm going to put under my mesh. I have my plastic, my bubble wrap, and then my mesh because it's just under here as my layout guide and we can take it out once we flip our scarf over. So I think you can see all of that. The first thing I usually do is plan out where my silk is gonna go. And our tutorial, our Pre PDF tutorial that you can get on our website is gonna vary from this slightly, but I wanna show you an easy way to start with this. Now, today's project is really, it's really beginner friendly. If you've done some wet felting, you can give this a go, especially since it's such a small project, it's very low risk. And we're not gonna do anything fancy, no really special techniques. We're just gonna be working with multiple types of fiber um, and multiple, fabrics, um, but nothing too um, adventurous yet. Now, you'll notice in our PDF 
that I lay out my basic silk plan and that's what we're going to do here. And then just see where I want everything to go. So this is going to be like a, not really a ruffle, but kind of a little layer along the bottom. This is going to be sort of across the middle. I'm going to put a small piece of this actually up here. I don't think I want that much. The nice thing about silk is, especially when you're working with big pieces, is you can just cut it and then rip it. You do want to take off any of the long strands. Um, by cutting them, don't pull them, especially once you're already in layout, because if you pull them, it pulls everything apart. Speaking from experience, of course, I like to have some things just kind of jutting off a little bit. And even though they're square, I'm not a very square <laughs> kind of designer. So we'll cover these up with fiber in a way that makes it interesting. This is the basic idea. I think I'm going to have some of my sari silk ribbons jutting off one of the ends. And I kind of like to approach any tassels or anything like floral design, and that is do odd numbers and vary the lengths a little bit. So three to five is a good number to see how that works for you. And I think we'll break it up, and since this side is so heavily purple, we'll have our greens coming off here, and then maybe some purple locks over here. And again, this is just the basic idea. So once I see the basic idea of what I want to do, then I deconstruct a little bit so that we can start layering. We have to layer merino top everywhere there's silk. And to get puckering on something like a habitat on the back, we need to have fiber underneath there so that it grabs from the back and will cause it to pucker. Now in our PDF version, um, you'll see that I have this base green silk um, or this top layer, base layer, much more narrow and that we piece fiber in between. But if this is your first project, you might find it a little bit easier to put fiber behind that first, a, a layer, just two thin layers of fiber behind that first, if you don't mind it being a little bit heavier, and that way you know it's 100% covered. It's not really the way um, I work if I'm doing something that's a little bit lighter. So this is, what I, this is how I'll do it. I'll do it exactly how I would do it. Firstly, I want this to be a little more narrow. I don't really want it to go the whole, the whole width. And now I'm going to put a layer of fiber right there. It can help to divide the thickness of your top. Some people call this roving, some people call it top. I've gotten over being too technical about that, right or wrong. And it can help if you split the width so that you have a more narrow band to work with. And I, I'm just gonna pull off little tiny, tiny thin wisps. Now, you can also, you can also do it this way, you can lay it out like this and shingle it across, which is how a lot of people do it. Um, and it's kind of laying down. I tend to lose a little bit of control when I'm doing that and get the, the pull out here. So I prefer to pull it off, lay it down and flatten it.
we just slightly overlap, maybe a third, you overlap just a third of the length, and little thin even layers. Having your fiber so that it's flat in your hand and there's no ripples allows you to pull it off more easily. So you want it to be flat. And now I'm actually just going to put my, even though that's just a single layer, it's a little thin right there, even though that's just a single layer, I'm going to put my fiber back on top of that, my fabric. And then I'm going to cover that edge. So I'm actually going to split that even to a thinner amount, but first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up and I'm going to have some purple going across there on this side. This is a merino silk blend. So you can see um, in this blend the silk is white and undyed. We have some others where the silk is dyed. So if you're working on the little thin band like this, you can also finger it like this. And I'm not very symmetrical, so I'll do things a little bit out of balance. And that's just kind of how I like it. So I'm gonna have that purple strip there, and then I'll add more green. We are going to add fiber to the back of the scarf when we get there. I'm going to add some of this plum in. This is Merino Top in Plum. I'm going to add it in right there. I just want to pause here for a second as we do this layout. Now, two things I said earlier. One was, if it feels too complex to sort of um, piece in fiber and fabric as you go, you can do one of two things. One is you could cover the entire area with two thin layers of merino top, so one going this way and one going this way, and then place all of your silk on top of that. Also, you could lay down your silk and then cover that with two thin layers. You could lay out a full band of silk, cover that with two thin layers of fiber, and then put the more silks on top. Um, the reason I like to do this is this way is because I don't want it too thick. If I'm doing a big shawl, there's certainly going to be open areas where I don't put any fiber on the silk. Earlier I stated that wherever there's silk, we need merino top, but what I meant was wherever two pieces of silk come together is where we want to join those together with fiber, and very often I'll do that both, both top and bottom. Um, and so you definitely can have areas where the silk has nothing on the back, and it depends on whether you want to be able to see through that, which I especially often will do on a shawl. But in this case, since it's a neck warmer, um, I probably am not going to have very much, I never know, I just kind of find my way as I go, but very much that's completely exposed. So in this case, we can either put fiber underneath this edge right now, or you can continue piecing and then add that when we flip it over. So just so you see what's happening, I'm going to go ahead and put fiber underneath these ends of fabric here, and also right underneath here. Um, the reason I don't like to put down a solid layer of merino 
or maybe even a solid layer of silk is because I like the variation between the colors and the fibers. I like a shawl or a wrap or even a neck warmer not to look like there's a front and a back per se. So you can tell that this side on this on this one that this is the inside, but it still has interest. So especially when you're doing a long scarf that you might wrap around your neck um, and you might see that underneath side, it's nice that it doesn't just look like white, which is how you learn maybe when you're first doing nano felt, when you make your first scarf or something, is you just have a solid piece. But for these multi-textural ones, I like to see the color on the inside. So I'm just going to, um, actually I'm, I'm going to leave this open and piece it in as we go because I want the colors to jive with what's happening on this side. So I'm going to change what I just said. I'm going to just do it how I normally do it. Now I have changed my mind. This little guy is going to go on this side. Um, and this is still going to come down here. But where this is, the fiber that's underneath is going to dictate how that looks. This pink could very easily, could very easily darken. And where this purple is, um, where these two come together, we have to have fiber. So right underneath this pink, I'm going to put a pink. It's not as bright, but I'm going to put some pink right underneath there. I'm going to go ahead and put some fiber right underneath there, right underneath that edge, right here. That little piece I pulled off just had little slubs on it. I just didn't want it right there. You can also trim this edge right there, go that direction, and then lay these fibers on top. You see quickly that I'm not the most scientific person. I'm going to put pink underneath there. So I'm going to go two directions. Very, very thin layers. We just want some fiber underneath for this fabric. We don't know if it's silk to grab onto. And then I am going to clump it down, actually. I'm going to clump it. I'm going to take it over onto the purple as well as to here. And I'm going to kind of allow it to be rippled. And then wherever there are I want it to divot in, we're going to put fiber on top of that. So right here where it meets the purple, I'm going to put purple. This is plum, but you know what I'm saying. I'm going to go over that edge and then this way. Coming off this way. And we're going to anchor the whole thing down that way. So where you see these valleys, that's where I want fiber. I want fiber in the valleys to grab on and along whatever is that edge. So this looks a little unconventional, but really it's okay. This is a multi-textural scarf. It's not just multicolored. And so right in there, I'm actually going to make sure I have some right underneath there. And we're going to go from we're going to go from the pink to um, a little more of this. So I'm going to do a little length here. And like I said, well, this seems unconventional. This is how I do it. It's like a it's kind of like a mosaic as it's coming together. You kind of if you've ever worked with tiles, you kind of find your way as you go. And for me, that's this is kind of similar. I did mosaics when I was younger, and you just kind of find your way. 
So right here on the end, we can have both colors coming across it. They can join. And then I need to get pink under here everywhere. I don't know if you can see that very well, I'm going to zoom in just for a second. I don't know if it'll zoom in on that part. Not very well. I can't zoom in. I can't zoom in any closer. So I'm hoping that you can you can pick up on that and just see that we are covering all of those edges of that silk. We really want them anchored down. You can go back and add fiber, but it is better, you know, it feels a little more cohesive to get it laying down when everything is dry. So tuck those under, and this is kind of big and bulbousy there. I don't want it to just lay flat. Once we start felting, I would rather have it pucker and do some funny things. So I'm going to put a little bits of fiber there. I generally don't cut my fiber, I'll, but I'll do this sort of swirly thing with it. So just bend it. Okay, so that is... We're gonna let it. We're gonna let it do its thing once it gets wet, and it'll lay down and kind of pucker in unique and interesting ways. If you treat your first project like an experiment, don't really worry about how, it, whether you love it or don't love it. Let it just let it let it come to life. Let yourself just be inspired as you work, and have fun with it, and then see you know what you want to change for next time. So here where these two things come together, remember kind of across here, I'm going to have this, and I think I'm actually gonna bridge all of that. So I'm gonna put fiber underneath this piece and on top, and then I also need fiber in between these two. So since I know, for example, that I want fiber all underneath here, I just have to choose what that fiber is going to be. So I am going to go um, two directions again, and I need fiber. So I have some fiber there, and I need fiber all along here. So I'm going to go ahead and just cover that little seam. And again, we will be putting fiber on the what will be the inside of the scarf when we get there. I'm going to just taper this down a little bit, it's a little bit thinner. 